Well, nickel is one of the really key industrial metals. It's mostly used in steel production, but nickel also has some very specific properties that make it essential in the energy transition. You could almost say that nickel enables the battery revolution because it's needed in batteries that are used in electric vehicles, for example. So let's have a look at nickel, what it's used for and where it comes from. Nickel is a hard and ductile metal and it also has a high melting point and corrosion resistance. These properties make it a very important industrial metal. Over 60% of nickel is currently used in production of stainless steel, with another 15-20% to used in other alloys and corrosion-resistant plating for steel. Adding nickel to steel and other alloys increases the strength and elasticity of the alloy, so it's essential in producing steel for applications that require high-strength steel, such as in bridges and other large building applications. Nickel is also used in certain types of permanent magnets that go into wind turbines. An increasingly important application for nickel is in battery technologies. Around 15% of nickel used already goes into making batteries. And that amount is about to increase dramatically. We consume about 3 million tonnes of nickel every year and that number has been growing fast in the past decade. In fact, nickel consumption has doubled since 2010 and it shows no signs of slowing down. Much of this is due to the increased demand for batteries for all kinds of technologies in our modern society and not least by the electric vehicle industry. The batteries used in electric vehicles are usually called simply lithium-ion batteries, but lithium is not the only metal that is needed in these batteries. The cathodes in most lithium batteries that are used in electric vehicles are made out of nickel, cobalt, lithium, manganese and aluminium. In many of these, nickel is in fact the most important metal in terms of mass. These other metals are necessary to both stabilize the very flammable lithium and to increase the energy density of the battery, which means basically making it lighter whilst at the same time being more effective and powerful. Particularly the nickel is becoming increasingly important in batteries for increasing their energy density, not least because cobalt is much more expensive. So as we are trying to reduce usage of cobalt, the amount of nickel in electric car batteries has kept increasing at the same time when the volume of manufacturing of electric vehicles is rapidly accelerating. Wood Mackenzie, for example, forecasts that the demand for nickel caused by manufacturing electric vehicles and their batteries alone will double nickel demand to almost 6 million tonnes by 2040. So nickel is going to be even more important as we move into the energy transition. But not all nickel is created equal. The nickel used in batteries needs to be very pure and there are some potential concerns about getting enough battery grade nickel. But to understand why, we first have to look into how nickel deposits form. In the Earth's crust, nickel is mostly present in tiny amounts in so-called mafic and ultramafic rocks, which basically means rocks containing a lot of dark minerals and very little or no quartz. These rocks make up the vast majority of the oceanic crust, but the continents contain some of these rocks too, either as intrusions formed during past magmatic events, or as remnants of oceanic crust caught up in mountain building processes. But to form nickel ore, you have to concentrate the nickel in the magma or in the mafic rocks into a mineable ore deposit. So nickel deposits come in two main types, magmatic sulphide deposits and laterite deposits. Let's have a look at the magmatic sulphide deposits first. Mafic magmas form deep, 
at the very base of the lithosphere in areas where the Earth's crust is splitting up. The mafic magmas, which contain the nickel in low concentrations, travel upwards into the crust. If sulfur is present in the crust, the magmas pick it up. But the sulfur doesn't easily mix with the magma, so the sulfur forms droplets of sulfide liquid in the melt. This is very much like oil forms droplets when poured into a glass of water. The two simply don't mix. Nickel and many other metals such as iron, copper and cobalt are attracted to the sulfur, so they move towards these sulfur liquid droplets and react with the sulfur, forming sulfide minerals such as penlandite, which is the main nickel sulfide ore mineral. The sulfide minerals have a higher density than the surrounding magma, so they sink and accumulate as sulfide-rich layers and bodies within the magma chamber. So if you have a source of sulfur in the crust, this process is really efficient in concentrating nickel and other metals such as copper and cobalt into an ore deposit. But let's now have a look at the other important nickel deposit type. Laterite is in fact a soil type that forms via deep weathering in tropical and subtropical regions, particularly those with alternate wet and dry periods. When the weathering rocks include mafic and ultramafic rocks, such as peridotite, which is a rock type found in oceanic crust, nickel ore deposits can form. Surface waters gradually weather the bedrock, enriching nickel and other metals, such as cobalt, into a mineable ore towards the bottom of the soil profile. Because in laterite deposits, the metals are concentrated via the weathering process and reactions with oxygen and water, the ore minerals are different from those in sulphide deposits. There are two principal nickel ore minerals in laterite deposits. One is a iron hydroxide, limonite, also called bog iron, and the other source of nickel is the rock type called garnierite. Both of these are essentially oxidation products of minerals and rocks that contain nickel. And this is important because it makes a huge difference whether the nickel is incorporated into oxides or into sulfides. Well, laterite deposits are and will continue to be very important sources for nickel. The trouble with laterite deposits is, though, that processing nickel that is pure enough for batteries from laterite deposits requires a huge amount of energy, and that is very expensive, much more expensive than processing magmatic sulfide ores. For batteries, you need high purity nickel to produce the nickel sulfate that is used in the cathodes. The chemical properties of the limonite and garnierite in laterite deposits mean they don't easily give up their nickel. So laterite ores are much more difficult to process to produce high quality nickel than sulphide ore, because extracting the nickel from sulphide minerals is much easier. To produce high purity nickel from laterite ores requires heating the material up at very high pressures together with acid. This is very energy intensive, so very costly, and the use of acid poses environmental risks if not managed properly. Lower cost processes, such as melting the laterite ore, produces lower quality nickel, which is mostly used in stainless steel production, as the nickel there needs to be only about 75 to 80 percent pure. Laterite deposits are currently producing most of our nickel, with about 60% of the metal coming from laterite ores. But at the moment, there are not enough magmatic sulphide nickel deposits to cover the growing demand for nickel. Emerging processing technologies have made it somewhat easier and cheaper to produce battery-grade nickel from laterite, but for example, Wood Mackenzie estimates that this capacity is not growing fast enough 
to cover the rapidly increasing demand. The quality of the nickel isn't the only issue with laterite deposits. Indonesia is a major nickel producing country with around 40% of the global nickel production. But mining laterite deposits there is problematic because the environmental and health and safety legislation in Indonesia lags far behind those in many other countries. As a result, laterite mining in Indonesia poses huge ethical challenges for the industry and for us consumers. Other geopolitical concerns exist too. For example, Russia is a major producer of nickel, providing around 10% of global nickel production, but it has recently become an increasingly problematic trading partner for many countries. What's more, there have been very few major nickel ore discoveries in the past 10 years. Despite nickel exploration budgets peaking in 2008, only a handful of major discoveries were made, much fewer than in the previous 10 to 15 years. As the current mines will inevitably close at some point, whilst nickel demand keeps increasing, where is our nickel going to come from? In fact, some analysts already predict a global nickel deficit by 2030. So as the demand for battery-grade nickel keeps increasing, even some smaller magmatic sulfide deposits are attracting some serious attention. And I know just the place to go and visit. It's time to go and look at some rocks. Scotland might not be the first place that comes to mind, when you're thinking about nickel deposits, but in fact, this area is geologically quite favourable for magmatic ore deposit formation. About 400 million years ago, there was a mountain belt here resulting from a collision between two continental plates. This mountain belt formed above a subduction zone, so before the lithospheric plates finally collided, there was a period of extension above the subduction zone. Mafic mantle magmas intruded into the crust, which is in many places rich in sulfur-bearing sedimentary rocks. So that makes ideal conditions for the formation of magmatic sulfide ores. Today, we can find these magmatic bodies at several localities across the northeast of Scotland. I'm visiting Aberdeen Minerals, who are exploring intrusions near Aberdeen. The core store and company offices are in Ellen, where geologists Cecilia and Jack show me around and tell me about the rocks they're working on. There's quite a bit of drill core here already and some really interesting samples of the sulfide mineralization on show. So the nickel in these rocks is, as is typical for magmatic sulfide deposits, it's in the uh, nickel sulfide pendulumite. Um, you can't really see it here because it's very, very finely disseminated in these rocks. Most of the uh, sulfides, so the metallic looking minerals in these, are actually iron sulfides, uh, pyrite and pyrotite. Pentlandite is the main nickel ore mineral in magmatic sulfide deposits, although many other sulfides, such as the iron sulfide pyrite, can also contain a lot of nickel within its crystal structure. Where the nickel sits is important, as it is much easier to process nickel from pentlandite than to extract nickel that sits within iron sulfides. So with modern technology, you can actually look at the chemistry of these samples in quite a high detail. And these maps here show where the nickel and the pentlandite actually are in these samples, and you can see how the pentlandite, so the nickel sulfide, is really, really finely disseminated in the rock. So let's have a closer look. This is the scan of the core, one of the pieces we just saw. This is the width of the core. And all the little red dots here are the pentlandite, whilst the pink stuff is the iron sulfide. So there's a lot of pentlandite here, 
although it is very fine grained. But how was this deposit found then? Ore's exploration is a process that can take quite a long time, even decades. Let's go and have a look at the site of the discovery. In fact, there aren't many outcrops of rocks at all in this area. So how do you go about finding ore deposits if everything is covered under the soil? Well, this area was explored a little bit in the 60s and the 70s by Rio Tinto, the company. What they found at the time didn't quite justify further investigations. The nickel price was fairly low and they did hit some mineralization, but not enough to actually keep them going. So Aberdeen Minerals have recently come back, done some new geophysical surveys to really understand how extensive the, this potential ore body is. The original discovery was made because Rio Tinto, who were exploring in the area, came across reports of elevated nickel concentrations in the agricultural soils here. They did some drilling and found some mineralization, but didn't pursue their findings as the techniques and the understanding of this deposit type was not fully developed in the 1970s. With modern geophysical and analytical tools, it is now possible to get a much more detailed understanding of the prospect, and that is what Aberdeen Minerals have been doing in the past couple of years. The geophysical surveys and drilling conducted so far have revealed an extensive body of sulphide mineralization, and investigations continue. The increasing demand for nickel combined with the recent geopolitical uncertainties mean that even smaller deposits like the one here in Ellen may well prove economic. Our need for nickel certainly is not going to go away. So we're quite used to taking the availability of nickel and indeed many other metals for granted, but we really shouldn't. With the demand accelerating and deficits looming with no major discoveries, we might yet be in a situation where the metals are just not going to be available to us when we need them and hamper our efforts to limit the worst effects of global warming. So we really should ramp up production and support sustainable and responsible mining efforts wherever we are.